محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد uh, so we were still discussing uh, we had just begun last week right at the end discussing the one final controversy uh, that needs to be discussed and that is the issue of fadak and khaybar we'll finish that up today and then move on to the wars of ridda and inshallah next week we'll continue the wars of ridda uh, talking about it from also from a theological aspect and we might be able to squeeze in one more week and then we will pause inshallah ta'ala uh, until after ramadan and then begin with umar ibn al-khattab inshallah ta'ala that is the overall plan if allah azza wa jalla wills so remember last week i had begun uh, the 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 issues of the controversies between the two groups of islam and last week the emphasis was on which controversy which controversy we talked about last week the bay'a of ali radiyallahu an and we explained that now the bay'a of ali was also linked with another controversy and that controversy is over the lands of fadak the lands of fadak and this issue has also generated quite a lot of uh, back and forth quite a lot of controversy between the two groups and uh, to this day it is considered one of those sensitive areas between the two groups so uh, just to shed some light on it and again I'm going to reiterate uh, I'm going to be very frank here in the seerah I went all out I went as much detail as I humanly could that I thought was realistic in the English language the only things I did not do was that which I thought might not be useful in the English language, such as shi'r and poetry and ansab. I kind of did summary of that. Otherwise, I did everything as much as I thought was possible. Uh, for, and so it was, I would say it was an uh, intermediate to advanced level seerah. As for Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and the Umar al-Khattab anh, and all of the rest, we are not doing it to that level. Because that would really be a class that would take half a year just for Abu Bakr, three, four years for Umar al-Khattab. We don't want to do that. So the issue of fadak, realistically, we could discuss easily three lectures just about fadak and go over the riwayat and whatnot. And there's just no need. Really, there's no need. So I will just go over it in maybe 10, 15 minutes, max a little bit more than that. And then we just move on and leave it at that, inshallah ta'ala. So what exactly is uh, fadak? And along with fadak, they also say khaybar and the lands of Banu Nadir. What happened was, if you remember, when we talked about uh, the expulsion uh, of the Banu Nadir, uh, they had given up a percentage of their land, of their produce to the Prophet ﷺ. And then in Khaybar, the Prophet ﷺ acquired some land that was acquiring from the battle. Then, before he could return to Medina, the neighboring lands of Fadak sent a message. And they said, O Messenger of Allah, if you, or, I mean, they didn't call him Messenger of Allah because they didn't believe in him. He, they said, Ya Muhammad, وسلم, if you don't attack us, we will give you 50% of our crops. They were worried that the Prophet would attack, even though we don't know would, would he have attacked or not. So they voluntarily gave the Prophet some fifty percent of the produce. Okay, this fifty percent of the produce was a massive amount. Obviously, imagine an entire uh, plains. It's not even a one one garden grove. It's like an entire inhabitant. This would, in our times, be the equivalent of millions of dollars. It is a huge amount of uh, money. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had explicitly said in the Quran that uh, whatever, and this in Arabic is called fay, and fay is different than ghanima. Ghanima is that which you fight and then you acquire. So ghanima is war booty. Fay is what the enemy offers you without fighting. And according to the Quran, fay is something that for the Prophet sallallahu in particular, it was his to do with as he pleased with. Later rulers, that's a different ruling. No. For the Prophet sallallahu Allah gifted him the fay. Mimma afa Allahu ala rasulihi. This is in the Quran, right? So the fay is something that is his to do with as he pleases because it was gifted to him. And as we all know, the Prophet sallallahu used that money for the benefit of the ummah. He did not benefit himself at all. We know this. And he passed away, sallallahu alayhi wa and even his armor was given as a loan to a, a, a Yahudi uh, when he had taken some money from him. This was the collateral or the, you know, the down payment, if you like, to make sure. That. So he didn't benefit from that money personally at all. And he would spend it in matters that a leader needs to spend in, which is taking care of the, 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 the masalih or the issues of the community. Now, uh, when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, Fatima is, of course, his only daughter left. 
and he has his wives. So technically, if the Prophet's mirath had been like every other human being, she would have gotten half because she's one daughter. And the wives of the Prophet ﷺ would have basically shared in the bulk of the majority and then others would have been given to either if there were other uh, cousins to have been found and of course there were cousins, they would have gotten it. Uh, Ali would have indirectly also received something. So the point is that a huge percentage would have gone to Ali and Fatima radiallahu anhum ajma'een. And so uh, the wives as well assumed that they deserved a share of fadak because it is a massive amount and even, you know, one-fourth or one-ninth, or sorry, one-eighth would have been a very big amount and enough for the needs of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the wives of the Prophet sallallahu and this is an interesting point in, in Sunni history books, who was the one who raised the issue of fadak? It was the wives of the Prophet sallallahu not Fatima. And this is an interesting twist because, as you know, the other group does not respect the wives of the Prophet the way we do. From our perspective, the fact that the wives raised the issue clearly demonstrates that there is no bias in our books. It's human nature. The, the husband has passed away. The wives are concerned about where they're going to get the money from. And so they decided to send Uthman ibn Affan to represent them and to ask Abu Bakr when they didn't get anything. So to send an emissary like we want our share now. We want to get our uh, share. And so they sent Uthman ibn Affan as an ambassador, if you like, between them and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And uh, to quote you one hadith, and again, these are the times when you open up the book and you have to quote it directly from the book. Uh, so in Sahih Muslim, so we know it is an authentic uh, hadith. In Sahih Muslim, uh, we have the hadith uh, number 4557 that Aisha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, narrates that Fatima bint Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked Abu Bakr after the death of the Prophet ﷺ to divide the inheritance between them. Whatever the Prophet ﷺ had left, whatever Allah had given him a fate, mimma afa Allahu alayhi. So this is that Quranic phrase, mimma afa Allahu alayhi. فَقَالَ لَهَا أَبُو بَكْرٍ So Abu Bakr said, إِنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ قَالْ لَا نُورَثُ مَا تَرَكْنَا صَدَقَ The Prophet ﷺ said, we do not... Inherit. We do not give away inheritance. Rather, whatever we leave, it will be a sadaqa. Whatever we leave, it will be a charity. Now, this hadith, one of the things that the other group says is that Abu Bakr was the one who narrated it. How can we trust Abu Bakr when it deals with the issue of Fatima radiallahu anha? She's the, he's the only one narrating this hadith. In fact, to disprove this point, the very next hadith, narrated in uh, Sahih Muslim is one of the most authentic chains that Sunni Islam has. Uh, Yahya ibn Yahya narrates from Malik ibn Anas. This is the famous Imam Malik. From Abu Zinadi, from A'raj, from Abu Huraira. This is called the golden chain. This is the best isnad. One of the top four or five isnads around which all of the hadith considered to be the most elite isnad. And this isnad is the most authentic to Abu Huraira. And it is, goes through Imam Malik. And he says... That the Prophet ﷺ says, so Abu Huraira is hearing this now. This is not from Abu Bakr. Abu Huraira is hearing this. That, لا يقتسم ورثتي دينارا ما تركت بعد نفقة نسائي ومؤونة عاملي فهو صدقة. The Prophet ﷺ said, my inheritance shall not be divided up, the money that I have left behind. Rather, whatever I have left behind, whatever I have left behind, after taking care of my uh, family, uh, it, it is all going to be صدقة. So Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, when Fatima came, uh, sorry, I actually jumped this. Fatima came later on. I was saying the wives of the Prophet sent Uthman. So Uthman says, Abu Bakr said to Uthman that, Oh Uthman, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi say, whatever we leave, it is sadaqah. It will not be given as inheritance. So uh, the wives then basically did not uh, ask for a second time. Then Fatima sent uh, as well to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And this is the story I should have quoted over there. Abu Bakr, so Abu Bakr as-Siddiq then said to Fatima that this is sadaqah and I cannot give it to you. Uh, and in the version of Bukhari, Ahari quoted, and it is also in uh, Sahih uh, Muslim as well, that Fatima lived six months after this incident, after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Abu Bakr uh, did not respond to her request to give fadak to her. 
And he said, I will not change anything that the Prophet ﷺ commanded us to do, and except that I will follow that command. I am fearful if I disobey anything from his command that I will go astray. So Abu Bakr said, I cannot disobey the Prophet ﷺ. I am scared if I went against his hadith that I heard that I will go astray. So uh, Aisha says, so as for the sadaqah of Medina, Umar radiallahu anhu finally gave it to Ali and Abbas. We'll explain what this means in a while. Uh, and Ali eventually uh, overcame Abbas in, uh, in this regard. Again, we'll explain uh, all of this uh, in a while. Uh, so the point being that in a nutshell, Fadak was a controversy between the wives of the Prophet and Fatima on one side and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq on the other side. And the both of them separately requested Fadak. And Abu Bakr denied the rights of both of them, or not the rights, the requests of both of them. Abu Bakr denied the requests of both of them based upon the hadith in which he said, I heard the Prophet wasallam say such and such. Now, this hadith is reported by quite a number of scholars, uh, sorry, a number of sahaba. In fact, over seven Sahaba narrated this hadith. And even in Sahih Muslim, we have uh, Abu Huraira as well, his narration. And in a version in Sahih Bukhari, when Ali radiallahu anhu later on came after the death of Fatima, and the issue of Fadak again came up, Abu Bakr was sitting in a gathering of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas and Uthman and Ali, and he said to all of them, I ask you, by Allah, I ask you, do you not know that the Prophet ﷺ said that whatever we leave behind is sadaqah? And they were all silent and did not negate what Abu Bakr as-Siddiq had said. And this hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. So Abu Bakr as-Siddiq is calling them all to testify that do you not know that the Prophet ﷺ said this? And it is very clear because we have multiple occasions in history that Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali are debating fiqh issues. Multiple times. Fiqh issues, they would go back and forth to one another. And Ali radiallahu anhu on more than one occasion gave a verdict that Umar actually agreed with and he changed his own opinion to the opinion of Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is multiple times. So in this instance, Ali radiallahu anhu did not say anything and Abu Bakr is asking him point blank that I ask you by Allah, don't you know the Prophet ﷺ said this? And they all فَأَقَرَّ عَلَى ذَلِكَ They all agreed that he had said this. So Ibn Taymiyyah actually points out that this shows that even Ali radiallahu anhu had heard this from the Prophet ﷺ. Or else he would have made another uh, point. So the point is that Fatima did not know this hadith. And, radiallahu anha, and neither did the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa directly know this. So when they heard the hadith, the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa simply did not ask again. And as for Fatima, <coughs> perhaps she had another interpretation or understanding. It appears that, as we said, there were some tensions between the two of them. And uh, in the version of uh, Aisha that is reported in Bukhari and Muslim, uh, she says that Fatima did not speak to Abu Bakr until she died. I mentioned this last time as well, right? That Aisha said that Fatima did not speak to Abu Bakr until she died. And as long as she remained alive, Ali radiallahu anhu as well, uh, seemed to have kept a low profile. Out of respect to his wife, out of uh, whatever his wife's feeling were, also she fell sick, also the Prophet had just passed away. So whatever the reason, Ali radiallahu anhu as well kept a low profile. It was only after uh, the death of Fatima radiallahu anha that Abu Bakr then visited Ali directly in his house. Remember I mentioned the hadith yesterday, right? And that was when the conversation took place between them. And the issue of Fadah came up again at that time. And that is when Abu Bakr said that I ask you by Allah, don't you know that the Prophet ﷺ said such and such. And so it is clear then that Ali did not respond, which means that he is accepting uh, this. Also, uh, Aisha says that Fatima did not speak to Abu Bakr till she died. This is very explicit. But this is Aisha's narration. 
And we have another narration in the Sunan of Al-Bayhaqi, uh, which is uh, an interesting narration, which says something different. And uh, this is a narration, uh, volume 6, page 301, uh, where it is reported uh, from a Sha'bi that لما مرد فاطمة رضي الله عنها أتاها أبو بكر الصديق رضي الله عنه when Fatima fell sick that her deathbed uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq came فَاسْتَأْذَنَ عَلَيْهَا and asked permission to come inside the house فَقَالَ Ali رضي الله عنه Ali said يا فاطمة هذا أبو بكر يستأذن عليك this is Abu Bakr asking permission to come visit you فَقَالَتْ uh, أَتُحِبُّ أَنْ آذَنَ لَهُ she asked Ali would you like it if I called him in? She's getting permission from her husband. فَقَالَ نَعَمْ Ali رضي الله عنه said, yes, I would. فَأَذِنَتْ لَهُ So Fatima gave permission that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq comes to visit her. فَدَخَلَ عَلَيْهَا يَتَرَضَّاهَا He entered in upon her and he يَتَرَضَّاهَا He basically eased the situation. In other words, like he placated her. He calm the situation between them. And this clearly demonstrates there was some minor issues between them. So, يَتَرَضَّاهَا means until she was content with him. حَتَّى رَضِيَ عَنْهُ يَتَرَضَّاهَا And Abu Bakr said, وَاللَّهِ مَا تَرَكْتُ الدَّارَ وَالْمَالَ وَالْأَهْلَ وَالْعَشِيرَةَ إِلَّا ابْتِغَاءَ مَرْضَاتِ اللَّهِ وَمَرْضَاتَ رَسُولِهِ وَمَرْضَاكُمْ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ Abu Bakr al-Siddiq said, I swear by Allah, I have not left my house, meaning in Mecca, and my money, and my family. In other words, I haven't done all that I have done. My whole life, he is saying, I haven't done all that I have done, except for the sake of Allah, and for the sake of the Messenger of Allah, and for the sake of the family of the Messenger of Allah. And in Sahih Bukhari, we said last week, the famous phrase, which is in Sahih Bukhari for us, that wallahi la qarabatu rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ahabbu ilayya min asli an asli min qarabati it is more beloved to me that i show kindness to the family of the messenger of allah than to my own family and he is swearing by allah and he is swearing in front of the al bayt in their house until ali radiyallahu began to cry i mean imagine the scenario and situation there is no animosity. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq had an ijtihad and he had a hadith for his ijtihad. And that is, I can't give you this as as, as sadaq, as, um, as uh, inheritance. I cannot give you fadak as inheritance. So he is saying I'm doing this basically because I believe this to be uh, correct and uh, this narration ends, ثُمَّ تَرَضَّهَا حَتَّى رَضِيَتْ He continued to placate her until she was satisfied with him. حَتَّى رَضِيَتْ and this is min marasil al shabi and al shabi is of the greatest of the tabi'un and al shabi reports from uh, fatima al shabi did not meet fatima but he's of the greatest of the tabi'un so uh, this is one of the sli- there is a slight weakness but al shabi is of the tabi'un and he was of that time period but he didn't actually meet fatima I'm just saying that min bab al amana so that you know uh, the reality nonetheless even al bayhaqi said that this is min uh, uh, marasil hasan it is an authentic mursal uh, hadith uh, so the claim that they did not uh, speak seems to be contradicted by this that in the end of her life radiyallahu anha uh, abu bakr as-siddiq calmed the situation down and everything was fine also uh, the claim that the two of them boycotted each other is simply not true uh, one of our classical scholars, and that is Badr al-Din al-Aini, he said, there is no report that the two of them ever met and then turned away from one another. Rather, she stayed in her house. And some people mistakenly interpreted this as abandonment or hajar, that she purposely avoided her. And al muhallab another scholar said, that the narration that she boycotted Abu Bakr, or in the Arabic is hajara, Hajara means to boycott, to abandon. The narration that she boycotted Abu Bakr was that she didn't go to meet him, nor did she send any messages to him, and this is not forbidden in Islam. You don't have to go to somebody's house to meet them. You don't have to send a message to them. The forbidden abandonment or hajar is that the two of them meet and then do not give salam to each other. And this did not happen in those six months. End quote. In other words, and we are fair 
Uh, and I, I want to point out here again, when it comes to these controversial topics, we have even madahib within uh, Sunni Islam. And there is a trend in Sunni Islam to overlook all of these ahadith and to paint a picture that is simply too rosy. And I don't agree with this because I quoted you Sahih Muslim, Sahih Bukhari. I quoted you hadith right in front of us. And in my opinion, trying to cover the facts always comes back to haunt us later on. And there's nothing un-Islamic about what has happened. These are personal, human difficulties. They happen. Uh, I, I, like, I really like what Imam al-Qurtubi said. Imam al-Qurtubi said, whoever examines what has happened between Abu Bakr and Umar, uh, sorry, Abu Bakr and Ali, sorry. Whoever examines what has happened between Abu Bakr and Ali, of the back and forth and of the excuses that they made for each other, and of the fairness that they demonstrated in their minor issues, will clearly see that each of them gave the haqq, the rights that were due to the other, and that both of their hearts were in agreement about respecting and loving one another. And if at times human nature got between them, still religion averted those negative feelings. This is a beautiful quote from Imam al-Qurtubi. And this is my position as well. Yes, human nature gets between people. And minor things happened. But the way that it is portrayed by the other group as being so big, wallahi, there's not a shred of evidence. And we also have to point out that the issue of uh, Fadak really is historically could not have been uh, the way that it is portrayed. Uh, it is narrated uh, in our books of history that uh, the founder of the Abbasid the Caliphate, he was called as Safah, uh, that was his title, was giving a khutbah when one of the uh, Shia uh, stood up because the Shia initially supported the Abbasids. If you know the history, the Abbasids and the Umayyads, the Shia sided with the Abbasids against the Umayyads. And they fought with the Abbasids against the Umayyads. So uh, the, the, the Shia movement sided with Sunni movements against the other Sunni Umayyads. So the initial Abbasids were a little bit pro-Shia and then that changed after that. So one of the Shia stood up during the khutbah of As-Safah and he said, I want your judgment. I want your judgment based on the book of Allah with a complaint that I have. So he said, what is the complaint? He said, I want you to judge between the matter of Abu Bakr and Fatima when he deprived Fatima of her inheritance at Fadak. Now this is happening 150 years after Fadak, and 1,500 years still is the same thing. That for them this issue is the biggest issue still. And they want to go back and resurrect and revive it. So it's nothing new. There. So, you know, Safah is, you know, 100 something years after, and still the man is interrupting the khutbah and saying, I want to know what, what the Qur'an says about uh, and, and by the way, so the, the Shia also quote the Qur'an, وَوَرِثَ سُلَيْمَانُ Dawood. So this is in the Qur'an, Sulaiman inherited from Dawood. And they say, look, the Qur'an clearly says Sulaiman inherited from Dawood. So the prophets will inherit from prophets. You understand their, their hujjah, right? And the response to this is, what does the ayah say right after that? وَوَرِثَ سُلَيْمَانُ Dawood. وَقَالَ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ عُلِّمْنَا مَنْطِقَ الطَّيْرِ the wiratha is ilm. The inheritance that Allah talks about is ilm. And the Prophet himself said that whatever we leave is not, we don't leave behind dinar and gold. What we leave behind is ilm. And whoever takes it has taken a large fortune. This hadith is also in Bukhari, right? That we don't leave behind dinar and, and dirham. What we leave behind is ilm. So the Quran actually supports the hadith. And when Allah says, وَوَرِثَ سُلَيْمَانُ Dawood, Sulaiman inherited from Dawood. He's talking about inherited this, the, the maqam and nubuwa and knowledge. Not about the fiqh issues of the mirat. In any case, back to what I was saying here. So he stood up and said, I want you to judge using the book of Allah between me and my complaint Abu Bakr. My, uh, my, my plaintiff is Abu Bakr. I'm complaining against Abu Bakr al-Siddiq when he deprived Fatima of the inheritance. So, uh, As-Saffah said that, do you think Abu Bakr did dhulm to Fatima? He said, yes, he did dhulm. So he said, and Umar after him, when he didn't return Abu Bakr's uh, decision, and he didn't give Fadak, said, yes, he also did dhulm. And Uthman too, when he con continued on the plan of Abu Bakr and Umar, and deprived Fadak of, uh, to the Al-Bayt, he said, yes, Uthman as well. Then he said, that means Ali as well. 
Because when Ali came in charge, he as well did not give Fadak over to the Al al Bayt. And he was quiet after that. Because there is no argument now. Historically, Fadak never was given over to the Al al Bayt. Even in the reign of Ali ibn Abi Talib, he didn't give it over to the Al al Bayt. Which means he agreed with the decision of Abu Bakr and Uthman and Ali. So the man was not able to respond. Now, just to finish up the issue of Fadak and then move on. Um, the issue of Fadak. Uh, is a fiqhi issue. It has no theological significance whatsoever. To read in theological significance is ludicrous. It's a fiqh issue. We do not know Fatima radiallahu anha's evidences, but she must have had something that she felt she has a right, and that's completely legitimate in fiqh to have a different opinion. But Abu Bakr as-Siddiq had an opinion that has an explicit hadith, and the rest of the Sahaba, including Ali radiallahu anhu, agreed with Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. Also, uh, the hadith of the, the Prophet I'm saying, we do not leave inheritance, is reported by many different Sahaba. I mentioned over seven of them uh, narrated it. Also, what is really interesting is that by depriving Fatima radiallahu anha of the inheritance of the Prophet sallam, Abu Bakr automatically deprives his own daughter. Now this is a point that cannot be explained by the other crowd. Think about it. When he said, prophets do not leave inheritance, who else would have inherited Fadak? His own daughter. And Umar's own daughter. And the both of them did not give Fadak over to their own daughters. This is a simple, common sense understanding that demonstrates there is no personal benefit that they're getting by depriving uh, Fatima. So it's not as if they themselves benefited from these gardens of Fadak. In fact, and this goes back to the narration of Sahih Muslim that I mentioned, this narration says Umar handed it over to Ali and uh, Abbas. Uh, so what happened was uh, the gardens of Fadak, they needed a manager. You know, you always have to have somebody that will take charge, assess, whatnot. So uh, Umar radiallahu anhu in his wisdom, he decided to hand it over to the Al al Bayt not as owned property, but as the managers. So this, obviously, it gave them a sense of, okay, at least we're managing. And you know, the managers, they get a small percentage. You know, whatever is the percentage of managers. You know, like if you have uh, houses and somebody collects the rent and whatnot, okay? Some of you guys are laughing, so you know what I'm talking about, okay? So uh, if somebody does this, so what do you give your managers? MashaAllah, generous, ya 10% he gives, MashaAllah. Your, your sahib is disagreeing with you. You give less, huh? MashaAllah. <laughs> so, okay, 10%. So, he, does he own the property? No, of course not. Okay? This is what Umar radiallahu in his siyasa, in his wisdom he did. That he gave it to them as managers. Now, I'm not saying they got 10%. I don't know what they got. I don't know. I'm just saying they got the percentage that a manager should get, but not the owner's. And this was of the fiqh of Umar al-Khattab. So he gave it to Ali and Abbas as the Al al-Bayt that, okay, he could have chosen anybody to manage, right? Because somebody has to go and assess and then deduct and whatnot. So in his wisdom, he chose the two of them to go and uh, do that. So in the end, he actually handed the keys, but not the ownership, the metaphorical keys, of Fadak to the Al al-Bayt. Clearly, I mean, to make this a big deal is absolutely uh, ludicrous. And there is absolutely no reason why Abu Bakr as-Siddiq would deny Fatima of her inheritance. Because what is he going to gain? Even they admit he didn't eat the gardens and put it in his own pocket. He left it for the, the, the treasury of the Muslims. And we know that he died wearing only the cloth that he owned. He didn't become rich, nor did Umar, nor did Uthman radiallahu anhu. So here's the point, what was his motive? Really, the, 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 the notion that his motive was just animosity and anger and spite, it is such a far-fetched, ludicrous notion that the history books do not support that. And uh, instead of giving them fadak, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu instituted the policy of giving them stipends from the treasury. They didn't have to work. All of the Ummahat al-Mu'mineen and Fatima got stipends till they died. All of the Khulafa gave them stipends as special status. These are the Al al Bayt. So Abu Bakr as Siddiq started that. And Fatima got that stipend. 
how and why then can there be any accusation of astaghfirullah, hatred or animosity? And the final point that I will say uh, about Fadak is that, uh, and I said this last week as well, one of my main issues with uh, the other movement is this, this notion of always wanting to go back and bring up these historical controversies. You know, even if they have a complaint against someone, they and we should both acknowledge Allah is the judge. And let Allah be the judge. Right now we are living 40, 50 generations after those incidents. And the descendants of Fatima and the descendants of Abu Bakr don't even know each other anymore. So you continue to bring this story up 1,450 years ago. And you think that something of benefit will come out of it. And you continue to have animosity and hatred to just let it go. And Allah Azza wa will be the judge. But our religion is not based on these historical issues. Our religion is based upon theology. And these fiqh differences and these minor disputes should not be uh, blown out of proportion, should not be uh, what not fighting and whatnot. And um, also for the sake of mentioning a full account, I just have to mention one, uh, one story that is unfortunately very common among certain segments of uh, the Shi'i community. But alhamdulillah, the more moderate of them reject this, this story. And this uh, story is a complete fabrication which has no basis in any authentic Sunni or even Shi'i book. And it is a, a story that unfortunately you find, especially the extreme uh, sectarian uh, clergy mention it. And this is a story that causes the most hatred uh, from that group to the Sunnis. And it is a completely fabricated story that has no basis whatsoever. And this is the story that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, when uh, Ali did not come to give bay'ah, he told Umar ibn al-Khattab and a group of Sahaba to force Ali to come and give the bay'ah. And so they went to the house of uh, Fatima al-Siddiq, uh, Fatima uh, radiallahu anha, and they barged in. And when they barged in, they shoved the door open, and Fatima was pinned between the door and her house, and she happened to be pregnant at that time, and she lost the child, and she was bleeding, and they put Ali in a chain, and they dragged him in, and they forced him to give the bay'ah, and Fatima died as a result of these wounds in six months. Now you understand this story, if it is said with its gory details and whatnot, will cause that group to really go berserk against those who respect Umar and whatnot. And this, radiallahu anh, and this is the main story that is used to incite hatred against Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And this story is a complete fabrication. Even moderate Shi'i clerics reject it. And they say, and I agree with them, they say, firstly, this book, this story is not found even in any of their authentic books. It is found in some of their more extreme books. Yes, I'm not denying that. But it, and, and these books, so. This is, I love talking about theology because it's my specialty, so I can go on and on. Even within Shi'i Islam, there are trends. Just like within Sunni Islam, there are trends. And it is one of our mistakes that we blanket all of them together. We say they're all like this. No. Within Shi'i Islam, there are trends. And some of those trends are more moderate and open-minded, and some are more narrow and intolerant. So within their trends, they have certain books that are more moderate. Other books that are, they're called the Ghulat al-Shi'a or the most extreme of the Shia. And these types of narrations are found in those Ghulat books. They're found in the most extreme books. And many of the moderate Shi'i clergy, they reject these extreme uh, books as being complete fabrications. So this story of Fatima losing her child and bleeding, and she nonstop bled until she died after six months, this story is found in one of their books. No need to go down the details of all of that. Uh, but one of their moderate clergy uh, said, uh, I think it was Hussein Nasr actually who said this, uh, that this story cannot be true because this would be a, uh, a very humiliating story for Ali radiallahu anhu that he was dragged by the chain and forced to give bay'ah and we don't expect Ali to be so cowardly that just because he's dragged and he's forced he to... So actually, we as Sunnis agree with this. Wallahi, we agree with this exactly. Everything we know about Ali ibn Abi Talib is that he's a brave man. 
So even the claim that he's dragged and forced to give bay'ah, you are actually humiliating him. You are actually saying he was forced. If you say that he was forced by what? How could you force him? Let him lose his life if he feels he's upon the truth. As they say, Hussein radiallahu anhu did later on, that's what their opinion is, then let it be. Why didn't Hussein, uh, Ali radiallahu anhu as well lose his life? If his right was the right of the bay'ah and it shouldn't have been given to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, then we say as well that Ali radiallahu anhu should have refused to give bay'ah and died uh, as a shaheed. But of course the whole story is a fabrication. And last week we went over the fact that, in fact, there was some tension. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq visited Ali privately. There was nobody else with him other than the Al al-Bayt. So all of the Al al-Bayt and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And he gave a moving lecture until they were crying, he was crying, they made up. This hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. It is very clear. That is our narrative. And so uh, with that, inshaAllah ta'ala, we are done with this story of uh, the Fadak and Fatima, uh, uh, Fatima and Ali radiallahu anhuma. And we now move on to the issues of the wars of the Ridda. The wars of the Ridda. Okay, so Abu Bakr al-Siddiq's Khilafah is primarily known for one thing and only one thing. That's the main thing that happened. And that is the wars of the Ridda. This is really the main. Abu Bakr uh, al-Siddiq really ruled for a very short period of time. Less than two years, as you know. Very short period of time. Imagine, less than two years. I mean, that's nothing in the grand scale of things. Uh, yet his Khilafah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used it to preserve the ummah. That's really what his whole khilafah was. That Allah azza wa jal used Abu Bakr as-Siddiq to keep the newly formed ummah. And it was because of his insistence to do what he did that Allah protected the ummah. If Abu Bakr as-Siddiq did not do what he had done, then the ummah would forever have been fragmented theologically and religiously, i.e., we would have had different versions of Islam from the very beginning. And we would have really bizarre interpretations, like we have in early Christianity, a whole spectrum. Whereas in early Islam, we did not have that variety of a spectrum. Rather, the bulk of Islam has always been the same, which is what we call Ahl Sunnah, Sunni Islam. The 80%, 85% of the ummah has been the same. Why? Because of the preservation that Allah Azza wa used Abu Bakr as-Siddiq for. So what exactly happened? I'm jumping the gun here. Uh, the wars of the Ridda are a series of expeditions. Some say over 25. So it's not just one war. We're not going to go over all of them. Don't worry because again, we're not going into that much detail. But the point is, a dozen, maybe some, maybe even two, maybe even three dozen. Lots of expeditions that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq sent out across Arabia and it was done against Ahl al-Ridda and of course Ridda uh, is it means to turn around or to turn back and the Murtad is the one who has turned away after he has been in the right direction to turn back so Allah Azza wa Jal uses in the Quran مَنْ يَرْتَدِدْ مِنْكُمْ عَنْ دِينِهِ whoever turns away from his religion so Yartadid he's the Murtad He's the one who turns away, apostizes is the English term. That once he was in the right direction, Salat al-Mustaqim, then he turns his back and walks away. This is what is the uh, murtad. And uh, in the seerah, we find just a handful of people, and we mention them you know, whenever the time came up throughout the, 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 the Madani period, that very few people had become uh, murtad. And for example, when Mecca was conquered, two or three people were to be killed because they were murtad and other things of that nature. Uh, but never in the seerah had a group or a community committed ridda. Never. In the entire life of the Prophet ﷺ had a group of people or a city ever committed uh, ridda. But what happened was, with the death of the Prophet ﷺ, and because of the new consolidation and the recent conversion of the entire Arabian Peninsula, Iman had not yet settled in the hearts of the new converts. People had embraced Islam for the wrong reasons, many people. Especially people in Central Arabia and far Northern Arabia and Southern Arabia. People in the periphery regions, in some of the Yemeni provinces, in the Bahrain province, in the Oman province, in the central provinces of Arabia, Najd and uh, Najd and Yamama, which is beyond Najd, uh, 
so Najd and Yamam and Bahrain, these are the three main strips there. And down south you have Oman and you have uh, uh, Yemen, provinces of Yemen. And of course you have uh, other provinces up north, which is where Syria begins. So the Hijaz, by and large, was stable. Ahl al-Ridda, or the Murtads, generally were not found in the Hijaz region. Iman had entered the people of Hijaz. But those tribes that had newly converted, and especially the ones that had converted last year, and there were also some tribes that had not converted, they simply sent a message of peace that we will not fight the Muslims. And the Prophet ﷺ had let that be because again, the time had not yet come to consolidate. And these tribes were primarily Christian because remember the Qur'an did not allow pagans to live in, in the Arabian Peninsula. But large quantities of Christian tribes down south and up north had sent letters and emissaries that, okay, we agree to pay the jizya and we're not going to uh, basically get involved in, in, in your affairs. So with the death of the Prophet wasallam, obviously this is the ideal opportunity for these tribes to simply break away. And there were uh, three types of riddah. So if you look at all of these multiple, as we said, over 25 mini things, you look at their stories and whatnot, some scholars um, derive there were three types of uh, people who had left or had basically Abu Bakr had to fight them. The first type were those who went back to Jahiliya paganism because some people still believed in idolatry. And they simply, especially the priests, especially the religious clergy, they needed their jobs back. And so they reintroduced idolatry after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. This is the first category of Ahl al-Ridda. The second category of Ahl al-Ridda were, and for them, of course, by the first category, I mean, there is no ikhtilaf. These are murtad. They need to be fought. And they were fought and idolatry was eliminated uh, from the Arabian Peninsula uh, very easily. The second category were a new phenomenon. And this is the one that the books of history mention quite a lot because it's just bizarre and unique. Because these stories are tantalizing and weird. And these are the stories of the false, or the pseudo-prophets. The false prophets. There was a phenomenon that began after the coming of the Prophet Once something is successful, people without the desire and without the brains follow and jump on the success. Right? This is human nature. Once the person who is the most authentic or the most, or the genius, it is business, whatever, simple. The one who does it first, everybody then wants to tack on. Correct? So the Prophet ﷺ, when he proclaimed he is Prophet, no one in Arabia had proclaimed this ever since the time of Ibrahim and Ismail. And that is why in the seerah we keep on coming across Wama Nabi. What is a Nabi? I never heard of a Nabi. And the Quran keeps on saying, no Nabi has come to them before. They should be thankful. They had never heard of a Nabi. It's not something they are familiar with. Now that the Prophet ﷺ has begun his da'wah, it has reached such success, what do you think losers are going to do? Tack on to the success of the Prophet ﷺ. That's exactly what happened. A number of false pseudo-prophets, kathaboon basically, came and tacked themselves on. And in the famous hadith, our Prophet ﷺ said, hadith is in Bukhari, that there will be after me 30 and this is, by the way, uh, all of these are Dajjal. So the, the notion there's only one Dajjal is incorrect. There's lots of Dajjals, but there's one big Dajjal. There's one final Dajjal. That is the Dajjal. Capital D in English. The rest are small d Dajjals. Okay? So anybody who claims to be a prophet is a Dajjal. Because the hadith says, Everyone says he is a prophet. So 30 Dajjals are going to come, each one claiming he is a prophet. And there is no Nabi after me. So the Prophet ﷺ predicted that there would be 30 such Dajjal. So this is the second phenomenon of Ahl al-Ridda, where groups claimed to be Muslim. They didn't return to paganism. Some of them 
prayed, even though we'll see in a while certain interesting changes they made to the prayer. But by unanimous consensus, they are Ahl al-Ridda, right? And this has now become a standard in Islam that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu set the standard. You cannot be a Muslim and believe in a Nabi after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You cannot be a Muslim and believe in a Nabi after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You are a murtad. Simple as that. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq set the standard. All the Sahaba agreed. Okay, you can do major sins. You can murder. You can plunder. You can loot. You can. You're not a kafir. You're not a kafir. You can have some bizarre beliefs. You're not necessarily a kafir with most bizarre beliefs, but there are two things that you get kicked out without any jury or trial. You don't. It doesn't need to have any any judge to check your aqidah or not. The average Muslim can just say to a person who believes this, "You are not a Muslim." If you believe you have another God besides Allah, or if you believe you have another Nabi besides the Prophet ﷺ. Simple as that. These are the two main things. You don't need to be a PhD in Aqidah to know that this person is not a Muslim. Okay, It's very simple. To believe in another God besides Allah, or to believe in another Nabi besides Rasulullah ﷺ, you have gone against the kalima. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Okay, so uh, this is the second category of Ahl al-Ridda. The third category of Ahl al-Ridda we will discuss next Wednesday. That is the big discussion next Wednesday. And that was the controversy between the Sahaba. The first two, there was zero controversy. Everybody agrees these people are not Muslim. The third category was the dispute between the Sahaba. What should we do? And what was that controversy? That controversy was over those who refused to give zakat. But they fasted and they prayed and they said the kalima. They simply said, we're not going to give you our money. This was the controversy that the Sahaba had a long discussion over. And we will talk about this controversy next Wednesday, inshallah ta'ala. Today, and we don't need to talk about the first group because it's pretty clear. You're going to return to Jahiliyyah. I mean, you know, that's, you're, you're, you're going to be fought and you're going to be gotten rid of. Today, we're just going to discuss some of the main stories in the next 20 minutes, inshallah. We'll discuss the main stories of which group? The false prophets one. The false prophets one. So, the most infamous of all of the false prophets was from which tribe? Guys, which tribe, I said. I know you know the name. Everybody knows the name. Which tribe? The Banu Hanifa. And the Banu Hanifa lived in which province? <laughs> that was a quiz question. Mm, Yamama, which is close to Najjah. Yamama. Uh, and Yamama is like modern day, like Qasim and Kharj, like this area. Which is, in our times, it is incorporated into Najd. In the time of the Prophet uh, Najd and Yamama were side by side. Okay. Um, so, of course, Musaylama, why was he the most famous? Remind me. Out of all of these the Jalun that came after the process immediately. Exactly. He was the most foolish and the most uh, filthy of them in that he declared his nubuwa in the lifetime of the Prophet. ﷺ. And none of the others did this. And if you remember the story of Musaylama, that Musaylama was a very, very elderly man very wise and scholarly in his youth. He was a Christian uh, learned man. He was not a priest. He was a Christian learned man. He had in fact gone to Rome. This is before the Prophet ﷺ. He had gone to Rome. He had learned Latin. So he is a scholar of the tradition. He had come back to his people and his people had made him a really big deal, which is understandable given the circumstances that in a, in a Bedouin illiterate tribe, he's coming back as a scholar, as a, as a person who's lived in Rome and has studied with the, the, the Qasawis and the priests and whatnot. So he's getting bigger and bigger in his fame and he was expecting the coming of a prophet because he had been in Rome, he knew that the, his tribe were Christian, the people were Christian. And deep down inside, he thought he would be the prophet. Deep down inside, he thought he now 
uh, and this is the, the standard of arrogance, isn't it, right? That you think you are worthy of doing this. And he felt, khalas, he's qualified. And he's just waiting for Jibreel to come knocking on his door. And khalas, now he has been initiated to become the Prophet. So when the Prophet ﷺ appeared, obviously he was not happy. But he said to his tribe, let us go negotiate with him. Let's see. And he came uh, to the Prophet ﷺ, so he visited him in Medina. And he was the only of these false ones that visited and had a talk with him. And he said with his arrogance, Wallahi, look at this arrogance, to the face of the Prophet ﷺ, he said, I will only follow you if you make me a prophet alongside with you. What utter arrogance. I will only follow you if I'm also a prophet alongside you. Just like Harun and Musa. So Musa asked Allah to make Harun a Nabi. So you as well, you're going to make me a Nabi. And the Prophet ﷺ picked up a twig. And he said, Wallahi, if you ask me this, I would not give it to you. You want me to give you a prophet? You ask me this, I would not give it to you. Okay, the arrogance, there is no Islam with arrogance. Anyone who puts a condition on Islam to Allah, this is not Islam. You cannot have any condition to accepting Islam. Because it is Allah's message. So this man did not want to submit to Allah. He wanted power. And there is no Islam like that. So Musaylama then refused to give bay'ah to the Prophet Wasallam. Can you imagine, I mean, wallahi, going all the way to Medina, seeing the Prophet ﷺ and turning back and rejecting. And that would be his fate then. Allah would punish him in this world before the next. So, after this, he then sent a message. You all know we did this in the seerah and the uh, Amal Wufud. He sent a message uh, with two of his henchmen, his messengers, uh, I mean, meaning his emissaries. And the message said that uh, Allah has made me a prophet. Khalas, he upgraded himself. Okay, self-upgrade. Allah has made me a prophet and you must accept me. And I'm fine with you being a prophet, but you have half the world and I have half the world. It's a big place, let's divide it half-half. And of course the Prophet ﷺ, uh, rejected him and he said to the ambassadors, were it not for the fact that ambassadors are not harmed, I would have had you executed. Meaning this is beyond the pale of acceptability in an Islamic state. Okay? That you cannot believe in a Nabi after the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, and of course this is a, a controversial issue about do, uh, do these people who believe in Nabis after the Prophet Sallallahu have uh, the right to call themselves Muslims that live in an Islamic state. This is something that modern, modern theories and modern nation states can discuss amongst themselves. And it is a very controversial issue. There's no doubt about it. And it is my position uh, that it is not a problem for them to live uh, in any place and, and, and land, but they should be clear who they are, that they should be clear what their beliefs are, and they should not pretend or claim that they are followers of the religion of Islam if they believe in a Nabi after the Prophet ﷺ. There is simply, we cannot agree to disagree on this point. Okay? And if they believe in another faith, then let them call themselves something else, but they should not say that they are the followers of the religion in which the Prophet ﷺ is the final prophet. Because you cannot have another god or another messenger. And I think that is very clear. And I think this is what the position I'm holding is the position that basically I don't know any difference of opinion. The majority, if not all of the scholars of Islam hold this uh, opinion. Uh, having said that, of course, there are things that happen in modern societies against them of mass mobs killing and whatnot. And of course, we're opposed to this. And I'm very clear as well that vigilante violence and mobs should not get involved in and kill other people. If people have other faiths and religions, that's their theology. And that's their position to hold. And Allah will judge them. In this world, Allah will... Uh, sorry, in this world, we don't have the right to just go and harm people in vigilante justice. But we have to understand that these types of laws can be modified. And in the reign of the Prophet Sallallahu it was completely inappropriate that there is a person who claims to be a prophet and the Prophet Sallallahu lets this go. And that is why he said to the ambassadors that were it not for the fact that you are ambassadors and ambassadors are not harmed, then I would have had you executed. The hadith is authentic. So he let them go. <clears throat> and when the Prophet Sallallahu passed away, Musaylama then said, I have the whole world. Khalas. Okay? 
خلاص. So look at his greed now. Okay, like literally the guy is a, what do you call the megalomaniac? Like he thinks he has uh, everything. By the way, remember I said last time some of his uh, wahi. You remember some of his Quran, huh? Alfilu malfilu wa madraka malfil lahu dhanabun wabil wa lahu khartumun tawil. Right? You heard others as well. Al difdaq, al difdaq. All of these, right? They said all of these, huh? What is, which one was it, huh? Yeah, al difdaq, al difdaq, al madraq, al difdaq. Right? It's uh, all of these bizarre things. Al difdaq is the frog. Right, the frog, what is the frog? Half of it is in the water, other half is in the air. It breeds our, you know, it's just ridiculous things. This was his, uh, his uh, Quran. Um, so uh, this is, uh, this is um, the uh, Musaylama al-Kadhab. Uh, another, another famous, another famous uh, infamous Dajjal or the Dajjala, a female, is Sajjah bint al-Harith. Sajjah bint al-Harith. And Sajjah bint al-Harith, she was from the tribe of the Banu Tamim, and she was from Najd proper. So there is Yamama, and then there is Najd. So Najd is farther than Yamama. So there's Yamama, Yamama then Najd, Medina's on this side. Hijaz, then Yamama, then Najd. So Sajjah was from Najd. And Sajjah, we don't know that much about her, but she was also a Christian. And by the way, so why are these all Christians? Because Christians, they believe in prophets anyway. So it's easier for them to make this false claim, number one. Number two, Christians were more educated than pagans. So Christians had more exposure to civilization. Sajjah as well seems to have been very learned before the coming of Islam. And she was in fact a very, very skilled poetess. Uh, Ibn Kathir and At-Tabari, they record some of her uh, 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 sayings and it is very rhyming and very rhythmic. So she was gifted with this talent of being very uh, eloquent. And so whatever she would say, she would always say uh, in the nathr. And we said nathr is a type of rap, basically. It's not the poetry, but it is a type of rap or a very profound rap. Whatever she would say, she'd always have it in that type of metered and structured uh, speech. And she also began to claim that she is receiving wahi from the heavens, that she's receiving wahi from the heavens. And she must have been respected amongst her people before this anyway. So her people followed her. And she reached out to a number of other chieftains of the Banu Tamim tribe. The Banu Tamim, by the way, all the Arabs here know, the Banu Tamim is like the largest Arab tribe ever. right? When you say the Banu Tamim, it is still to this day, it has, I don't know how many hundreds of mini branches. Even in those days, the Banu Tamim had lots of branches. And so she's the head of one of the branches. She reaches out to the other branches and a number of them agree to join her. Amongst them is the most famous uh, Malik ibn al-Nuwayra, whose story as well is well known in the time of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And if we have time, we'll discuss this. Another minor controversy happened with him and his death. Uh, but Malik ibn al-Nuwayra uh, actually had visited the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ, and he accepted Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ appointed him to be the, the, he was the chieftain, so the Prophet ﷺ allowed him to be the chieftain. And he was supposed to be the tax, the zakat collector, send it back to Medina. When the Prophet ﷺ passed away, Malik ibn Nawayla used this to basically say, I don't have to pay zakat. Then he joined Sajjah. And this clearly shows that joining Sajjah was in fact a political move so that he has protection against the caliphate from attacking him for the zakat issue. It's not as if he actually believed. And so more and more of them joined together with Sajjah, and Sajjah decided to launch a full-off offensive against Medina. She wanted to attack Medina. But on the way to Medina is Yamama. And in Yamama there is Musaylama. And between the two of them, the Banu Hanifa and the Banu Tamim, there were tensions from the days of Jahiliyyah. So Sajjah said, on the way to Medina, we will first deal with Musaylama. Clear? Okay. So Musaylama heard the news. Sajjah had managed to gather 40,000 people. I mean, that is a huge number. Huge number. And the main reason that she gathered this many people was because here's the point here that there's revolutions going on. The revolution of Islam has come. The air is exciting with people now claiming power. Muslims are a political entity. So now other groups want to take over. 
So the Tamim tribe feels we can now take over what the Prophet have done. Most of the people did not convert to Sajjah or to Musaylama. Remember I said this last uh, many, many months ago when we talked about Musaylama that when one of the Sahabi asked one of the Banu Hanifa, do you really believe in this guy? Do you really believe in him? What did their guy say from the, uh, from the tribe of the Banu Hanifa? Bani Hanifa ahabbu ilayya. The liar of Banu Hanifa is more beloved to me than the truthful one of the Quraysh. This is the attitude, right? The liar of Banu Hanifa is more beloved to me. He's my blood. I'll have him as my ruler rather than the truthful person of the Quraysh. So what we need to understand, these people don't believe Sajjah is a prophetess. Or maybe some of them did, I'm not, but I'm saying bulk of them is just political. You want to gain political power. So Musaylama hears, Sajjah has 40,000 troops and she's marching against you. Musaylama panicked. He did not have 40,000 troops. And if 40,000 troops came to him, most likely he would have been killed. So he, and you can tell this man is a politician. He is a, uh, uh, a skilled politician. He decided to gamble on a tactic. And that tactic is very bizarre, very interesting. And it is mentioned in a lot of detail in Al-Tabari and other books. Uh, he ordered that, uh, he sent a message to Sajjah that... We should meet the two of us because you claim to be a prophetess. I claim to be a prophet. The both of us can't be right. So let us debate it out and let us see who amongst us is the correct one. Okay? So she agreed. She fell for the trap. Then he said that we will build for her a special tent outside of the encampment of the tribe of the Banu Hanifa before she gets to the city in a place away from the city. And he ordered a expensive and lavish tent be built, made out of brocades and silk and cloth. And he ordered that fountains be brought in, bukhur and rose water, and all of the... Now, he is the chieftain of his tribe. He is well studied and well amassed a fortune. He basically built a, not a palace, but a tent palace, if you like, okay? Brocades and linings and everything. And he said... Let her be reminded of what beauty is. She is a woman in the end of the day. That's his point. Let her be reminded of what beauty is. And he then commanded that uh, she should be sent into the tent by herself for a period of time. Let her see all that is in there. And Allahu alam, what other items and what other decorations and what else he had put in all of this. Then he as well came in after having dressed himself in the best of all garments, after doing all that he could possibly do. And they began to talk with one another. And here is where At-Tabari mentions things that I cannot mention in the masjid, uh, that some serious talk started to become flirtatious talk, which became vulgar talk, which became sexual talk. One by one by one. In other words, this was his plan. And until finally it became extremely vulgar and blatant between the two of them and they ended up committing zina. They ended up committing zina in the uh, tent. And of course, this was all planned by him. I.e. he wanted to seduce her. That was his tactic of doing that. And when they were done with the deed, and believe me, Tabari goes into details that I cannot mention over here, but for those who are interested, it's some interesting poetry between the two of them. That is not rated uh, G, let's just say. Um, and when, uh, when they were done with their deed, uh, he then made the offer that why don't the two, two of us join our forces as we had joined ourselves? Let us join our forces and we will get rid of all of the other Muslims. So this was, I mean, a sly, conniving politician, dare I say? I mean, you know, it's like, what can I say, right? I mean, this was his tactic, that he wanted to join forces together, so he seduced her with all that he could, and it worked. And now he says, let's join our forces together and attack the, uh, attack the Muslims. So she says, 
in that case, you must propose to me in front of my people. I mean, this is done in private. I can't, what am I going to say? We did something in the tent. So when we come outside, you have to then propose to me in front of my people. So it's a public thing. So that's what he did. That she walked outside and he basically said that, uh, you know, I am convinced that she is upon truth. She is convinced I'm upon the truth. I.e., he changed his mind that only one can be upon the truth. We're both prophets. And the two prophets have to marry together. So he proposed to her in front of her people, meaning pretending he's a noble man, as if he's done nothing in the tent, right? You get the point that proposals should be uh, public things. Uh, and so uh, her people... Uh, when they saw that she was happy and willing, so they agreed to follow her in this regard. And, and here's where the story gets even more bizarre. So uh, they said, you must gift her the most expensive mahar because she is a woman that requires a high mahar. So he thought for a while. Then he said, who is your mu'adhin? So they were still praying because these people, they accepted Islam, whatever they did, and then they didn't go back to Jahiliyyah. They invented a new religion. Okay? And this clearly shows even if you pray and you believe in another prophet, you are not a Muslim. Again, these are very clear things here. Okay? So he said, who is your mu'adhan? So they sent somebody, this is our mu'adhan. So he then said, um, my mahar to you as the prophet of Allah is that the other prophet from Medina gave you five salawat and I will gift you two of them. You don't have to pray. Fajr and Isha, exactly. Fajr and Isha are my mahr to you that you can sleep in during those times. Okay? This was the weirdest and the most kufr mahr in the history of Islam. That he gifted them, Fajr and, uh, and Isha. And of course, it's not a coincidence that our Prophet ﷺ said, the most difficult salah for the munafiq is, we were just doing this the other day, the most difficult salah for the munafiq is, Fajr and Isha. So these are not just munafiq, these are kafir. So in any case, uh, she stayed there for a few days and then uh, she went back. So she changed, she delayed the plan of attacking Medina. I guess she's in her honeymoon, she wants to now enjoy. So she goes back to her land and he stays in his land and the plan was to join forces and attack Medina. In the meantime, Khalid ibn al-Walid is sent by Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And by the way, uh, we have to finish up here and continue next week. So the wars of the Ridda are what made Khalid Khalid. The wars of the Ridda are what made Khalid and Walid Khalid and Walid. Yes, he had done what he had done in Mu'ta. And the Prophet called him, Sayfu min suyufillahi maslul. You are the unsheathed sword of Allah. But Mu'ta was just a maneuver to save. He didn't quite vanquish the Romans. And during the rest of the lifetime of the Prophet there wasn't any military engagement. So it was the wars of the Ridda that established the legacy or opened up the doors that Khalid ibn Walid would then be put in charge of the armies of the Futuhat against Rome and Persia. So the Ridda wars were his stepping stone to fight, and this is all Allah's plan obviously. The Ridda wars were the, the stepping stone to then move on to the actual battles between the Romans and the uh, Persians. So he sent Khalid ibn al-Walid to fight Musaylama in al-Yamama and the uh, forces of Khalid, of course, uh, completely annihilated uh, the forces of Musaylama. Uh, you all know that Wahshi was particularly eager to go because he wanted to kafara, to make up for having killed the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu the uncle uh, Hamza, and he took the same javelin that he used to kill Hamza with, and he said that his niyyah was just to kill Musaylama because he wanted to now defend the honor of the Prophet ﷺ, just like he had hurt the feelings of the Prophet ﷺ. Now he wanted to get that back. So his only goal for going, and the only person he killed, was Musaylama al kadhab who was of course protected, I mean in the middle, but again, Wahshi being Wahshi, that was his whole goal, that's what he's known for. He managed to kill uh, uh, Musaylama al kadhab Sajjah at this point was still in Najd. By the way, so Musaylama's followers, some of them still remain, by the way, and they fled away here and there. They remained on that religion for another few decades, believe it or not. Books of history mention there were still some small followers until finally in Qaradu, they just dissipated and disappeared. Sajjah, she was still in Najd. So when she heard of Khalid's arrival, she simply fled. 
and she and she fled to Iraq, and that at the time Iraq was not conquered by Islam. Eventually, Iraq was conquered, and she was in Basra and Kufa, and she moved between Basra and Kufa. And by that time, by the time Islam came, some time between this incident and Islam coming, Sajjah had repented, re-accepted Islam, and lived the rest of her life as a zahida, abida, ta'iba, just like ascetic saint. This is one of those interesting quirks. So when Islam came to the lands of Iraq, Sajjah had already embraced it and she was already openly repentant and therefore she was left unharmed because she had embraced Islam of her own free will. And she died a Muslimah and uh, the, um, the governor of Iraq, subhanAllah, the name is missing me now, but the, the Sahabi, famous Sahabi, he prayed Janaza for her, prayed Janaza over her, Sajjah. So this is one of those interesting twists that one earlier part of her life she claimed to be a prophetess, and then she repented. And if you repent outside of the reach of the state, even for such crimes, it shows something. And she embraced Islam again, and she died uh, a Muslim. And there are other stories as well. Inshallah, we will continue them uh, next Wednesday, inshallah ta'ala. And I'll try to finish the Ridda Wars next Wednesday. I might not be able to because there's uh, a number of things to do. And also have to mention the, uh, the uh, compilation of the Qur'an as well, very briefly, uh, the, with the uh, Khilafah of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Uh, so inshallah, that is the end from my side. I have.